nhóm thang nó lại nữa nhóm thang miệt chăng lại nữa nhóm thang nhóm chăng nhóm chăng bờ cứ hết yeah I uh, they, me do you share place I think I do I'm sorry Mr interpreter could you repeat that last part yes uh, do you remember the place I said yes I do okay and then did you take them there man yo quarter lại nữa nhé and at that time um, I did take them to the place my uh, younger god brother was afraid so he did not go with us I believe you said that neither you or your younger god brother touched the skull is that correct uh, yeah, that's correct. That we did not touch. Thank you, Mr. Me. That's all the questions I have for you. Thank you. You are, uh, thanks to you also. Mr. Air will probably have some questions for you now. Look, mate, we air behind me, no class in that corner, but no? Yes. Good morning, Mr. Me. I don't just like on me. So, on direct, I think you said you got to a mushroom picking area and didn't find any mushrooms. That's correct. We did not find any mushroom. Uh, the snow was deep. Um, now, was that a normal area you would have expected to find mushrooms? Had you been there before? I've never been to that area. That was the first time we've gone there. Um, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. I, did it seem like there were simply no mushrooms there or it had been picked out? Uh, they already picked all the mushroom. I went there to pick a chaka mushroom uh, to make tea because of the cold weather. So somebody had already picked the mushrooms that thought had been there. Yes, yes, they did already pick all the mushrooms. And like you said, you, sorry, that, um, this was the first time you had been to this area. Yes, uh, uh, my first time I went to that area. So, for example, the skull you saw that day, you don't know where it had been the day prior. I think maybe uh, animals on animal um, um, pull away the, the head uh, underneath that tree. Maybe that reason I saw it. And you didn't see any other bones around it? I couldn't understand the same number. Not me. No. That's all I have. Thank you. You're welcome. I do not have any other questions. Then you're, you're done, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That turned it on.
Good morning to them. Good morning. Please remain standing, raise your right hand, and we'll swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony we give in the case now before this court to be the truth, the whole truth, not but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please be seated and please stay. It's Ryan Anderson, R Y A N A N D E R S O N. Good morning, Trooper Anderson. Good morning. Where do you work? Uh, State Trooper out in Palmer. And how long have you worked there? I've been with the Troopers for 12 years at the end of this month. What are some of the, what's some of the training and experience that um, you have received to become a Trooper and after being a Trooper? Uh, I started my career at the Public Safety Academy down in Sitka. Uh, at the time, it was a 16-week training academy, live-in. And then after graduating that academy, I attended a three-week Trooper Basic Academy. Um, that was basically all the training required in order to get my police certificate. After leaving the academy, I did my field training in the Palmer area, and I was stationed there for two and a half years on patrol. And then I've had uh, various assignments since then. So you're currently assigned to the Palmer Palmer detail? Correct. Okay. And were you assigned to the Palmer detail back in 2019? Yes, I was. Okay. Did uh, you respond to an area on the Old Glen Highway um, on April 10th, 2019? I did. And what was the nature of the, re the response as you were aware of what the call out was for? Uh, our dispatch advised that someone had uh, located a human skull in the woods just north of the highway. And at the time, uh, what was your position at the troopers? At the time, I was uh, the rank of trooper, and I was assigned to what was called the Palmer Criminal Suppression Unit, which was a subset of patrol where we uh, did proactive uh, investigations within basically felony crimes, so property crimes and other felony crimes. So would you be considered a supervisor in, in that kind of role? At the time I was at the rank of trooper, I promoted about seven months after this incident. Okay. As the rank of trooper, um, who was responsible for... Who, call, who was called out that day and who responded? So I responded as well as Sergeant Covey. Um, Sergeant Covey was doing some uh, enforcement in the Knick River area that day. I think we were the only two uniformed troopers that responded. So you and Sergeant Covey, Covey responded. What did you see um, or, and do when you upon your arrival? So Sergeant Covey had arrived before me and uh, contacted the complainant. Uh, and when I arrived, Sergeant Covey advised that basically told me where the skull would be located. And so I walked out in the woods to go find it. What area of, uh, what area of Alaska are we talking about? So this is about mile four, the old Glen highway. Uh, that's just South of Palmer and just East of the main Glen highway. It's just right near the Knick river. And uh, it's also right next to the Occlutna tail race for those that are familiar with that area. How far would you say the skull was from the road? Uh, it's probably about a hundred yards or so, maybe a little bit more. And do you, based on your arrival, were you, was it something you would be able to see from the road where you parked? Oh, you could not see it from the road, no. Okay. So, um, Trooper or Sergeant Covey uh, told you the general area, or did he walk you back there, or uh, did you both go together? I just walked back there. Okay. He stayed at the road. Okay. And did he uh, meet Mr. Mees and his companion? I believe so, yes. Okay. Was Sergeant Covey the one that actually got there before you? Is that what you said? Correct. Okay. And um, Judge, may I approach the witness? Yes. Okay. I've given you what's been marked as state's exhibits one through nine. Do you recognize those? Yes, I do. Okay. And just generally, what are those pictures of? So exhibits one through six are photographs that I took of the skull when I arrived on the location. And then seven, eight, and nine are essentially Google map images of the area, as well as uh, number nine has our search and rescue cadaver dog efforts. Okay. Um, and are those, uh, those exhibits, 
fair or true and accurate representation of what you saw that day and the involvement that the troopers had in this case. Yes. At this time, I'd like to move to publish state's exhibits one through nine. Any objection? They're admitted, you may publish. Apparently I forgot the word admit and then publish. So I'd like to move to admit and then publish. They're Sorry. admitted I think and you may publish. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> Look at first at um, exhibit number one. Okay. What are we looking at here in exhibit number one? Uh, so this is the wooded area and basically uh, when I first saw the skull as I was walking into the woods. And we're gonna move then to exhibit, now it's working, or is that you? You did that. Okay, okay. Exhibit number two. Uh, this is just as I approached a little closer. At the point that you approached the skull, did were you aware of either you, well, did you touch it before or move it in any way before you started taking photos? No. And did uh, Sergeant Covey touch it in any way before you started taking photos of it? No, I don't think he'd been back there yet. Okay. Can I go to um, now exhibit number three? Uh, just a closer photo as I was getting closer. Okay. And then exhibit number four. Uh, number four is myself holding a, a ruler or a scale up to the skull. And why do you do that? Uh, since photos are hard to tell, like definition of size, it just gives a reference to the size of the, the item that we're photographing. Okay. Number six, I'm sorry, number five. Uh, number five is uh, now I'm manipulating the skull. And I believe this is the bottom essentially of the skull looking up at the upper jaw. And then number six. Uh, at this point, I had turned the skull to the other side. So we're looking at the left side. Um, did you notice anything in particular about the skull at this point? Uh, it's hard to tell in this photo, but in the in the center of the skull, there's a, a large leaf. And then just in front of that, if you will, there's a hole in the skull. So there's a picture up um, on the TV behind you. Yeah. Can you point to kind of the area that you're talking about? If, if you want a pointer, there's one there. I think I can reach. Okay. So towards the front, there's a there's several leaves on the skull, but for the record, it's the leaf leaf closest to the front of the head, and then the there's a hole just to the lower left of that leaf. Is that inaccurate? Yes. Okay. Placement of the hole. To get a better idea of uh, the area that we're talking about, here is exhibit number seven. Can you describe for us what this is? Uh, this is just a, looks like a Google type image of the area. This would be just west of the location where the skull was located. And in this photo, you can see the Eklutna tail race and the Eklutna power plant, which are pretty popular landmarks in the area. And then uh, slide number eight. Uh, this would be a similar photo, but to the east of the last photo, you can still see the power plant there in the middle. And this would be the area in which the skull was located. Are you able to point um, on this particular map what area of the skull or area where the skull was located? Yes. I have a pointer. Right in this area. Okay. So we're kind of just a little bit to the right of the middle of the photo. Correct. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> the troopers, um, you, you were involved in the response to this uh, investigation. At some point you said you became a sergeant. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, when you become a sergeant, um, do you take on more responsibility? I do. And what, is, uh, what does that responsibility include? Uh, so in addition to all the roles a trooper would have, such as investigating crimes and responding to calls for service, managing search and rescues and whatnot, um, I also supervise troopers now on patrol that are engaged in those activities. Did you officially become assigned to this particular case? I was assigned to this case um, up until about October of 2019. Okay. 
I want to talk a little bit about um, what uh, the response was then after um, this skull was located. What did the troopers do? So I had uh, seized the skull and submitted it to the state medical examiner's office for identification purposes. And then I worked with our Bureau of Investigation to basically coordinate efforts in locating the rest of the body. Uh, we utilized volunteer search and rescue workers that have canines that are trained in searching for cadavers. Did, um, based on that, what kind of efforts did the troopers make to look for additional uh, remains? I believe we had done quite a few days of various searches where dogs uh, had gone out into the area looking for further human remains. And was that shortly after these were found? Yes. Okay. Do you recall off the top of your head the time frame for when that occurred? I want to say it was within the two weeks of finding the, uh, the skull initially. And what is the date that you actually responded um, to this particular call? I believe it was April 10th. Of? Of 2019. Okay. So you um, sent the remains off to the medical examiner's office. Did the medical examiner's office keep in contact with you about um, whether or not they were able to identify this, the remains, if they were asking for additional information from you? Uh, they, they were doing their efforts to identify the skull. They were cross-referencing missing person cases um, in their efforts. They had contacted me a couple of times just asking for any names or knowledge that I might have of missing persons in that area. We had provided them with a list of names. And I believe ultimately all the names that we provided were not matches to the skull. Were you aware of the efforts of the medical examiner's office um, made in, a, in attempts to identify the skull in terms of sending it off yeah, for the, further analysis? Uh, uh, the, the, at this point, we approach. You may. As your investigation remained open, were you kept informed periodically from the medical examiner's office as to what might be happening in efforts to try and identify the skull? Uh, yes, I received emails from the medical examiner's office. Okay. Was there a point in 2019 when the troopers returned to this area and did additional searching? I believe uh, the Alaska Bureau of Investigation had. I was not involved in that particular effort. Um, <clears throat> so I want to show you last uh, exhibit number nine. <laughs> and you talked about some of the efforts that the search and rescue had done to identify or locate additional remains. There's a lot of, um, can you tell us what we're looking at in this particular picture? So in this picture, it's basically an overlay of the last exhibit we saw. And in this picture, you can see a bunch of basically colored squiggly lines. Uh, these lines represent uh, GPS trackers that are placed on the dogs with the search and rescue team to track where they actually had walked and searched. Okay, one more.
When um, you initially were um, providing names of missing inform information um, to the medical app office for potential identification means, was one of those individuals named Veronica Abachuk that you provided to the medical examiner's office? Uh, we did not provide that name, no. Oh. Those are all the questions I have for Sergeant Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. That's my question, if you have any. Um, no cross -judge. We're done, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we call your next witness. We expected Dr. Rolf at 10, but um, yeah. and this is Christy Grimaldi. Please come up here next to me, ma'am. Yeah, watch out for that hazard there. Morning. raise your right hand and swear you in. Can you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you will give in the case not before this court will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please receive them. Please state your name. Please spell your last name. Right. My name is Christy Grimaldi. Um, that's G R I M A L D I. Whenever you're ready, Council. Thank you. Ms. Grimaldi, I'm going to have you introduce yourself to the jury. Um, who are you? Where do you live? Um, I'm a resident of Big Lake, Alaska. Um, I grew up in the valley, um, some in Anchorage. Uh, my mother. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> well, let's start with that. How are you related to this case? Why are you here today? Uh, Veronica Bauchuk is my mother. Um, I'm her oldest daughter. How many siblings do you have? Uh, there are four of us. Okay. And you're the oldest? Uh, second oldest. Second oldest. Oldest daughter? Yes. Okay. And um, does she have a large, do you have a large extended family, aunts and uncles? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I grew up with my father mainly um, on my dad's side. I did have a relationship with my mom my whole life. Um, but uh, I mainly grew up with my father's family. Um, tell me about your mom's family. How many brothers and sisters does she have? Uh, I know she has a lot of sisters. Um, I didn't meet... Um, well, I met them at a young age. Um, I know we had went to the village when I was real little. Um, but my more memorable um, meetings with my aunties were when I was um, early teens. Um, and, sorry. Sure. And when you say the village, where did your mom grow up? Um, I know she's from St. Michael's. Um, and I want to say Stubbins is real close to that. That's where our family lives now. And um, what was your contact like with your mom in the last few years of her life? Was it constant or sporadic or something else? Um, I'm a single mother and I dedicate my time to my boys. Um, I saw my mom as much as I could. But um, it, you know, was here or there. Um, was there a time in 2016 that she tried to live with you for a little while? <laughs> I, I had my youngest um, in 2016. And forgive me, my memory is really bad, but uh, I had 
had her try to live with me in 2016 sometime. Um, it was very difficult for her, and I don't know exactly why, but um, she couldn't stay. I just remember her saying, I have to go. I'm like, Mom, where, where are you going to go? <laughs> and um, so we both uh, shared our frustration. I even tried keeping things of hers to try to get her to stay. And for some reason, she just couldn't um, handle um, that setting. And um, I may have spoken to her in 2007, but it's really hard to recall. Um, when you say seven, do you mean 17? 2017, sorry, yeah. Okay, and there, there are tissues right to your immediate right if you need them. So after she moved out in 2016, you may have spoken to her in 2017, is that correct? Yeah, I can't remember. And if I did, it was very brief. And I want to say there was still that frustration. Um between us would she check in with her other family as far oh, as yeah I uh made contact with family just to make sure hey have you seen his mom and uh I remember seeing a photo in 2017 with my aunt uh Margaret at some point did you well, after your mom left your your home, do you know where she was living? Um, no, um, I had spoke to another family member and it was hard for him to recall, but uh, there was a point where she was doing relatively well and had her own place. Um, I believe she had assistance um, from some state or organization where they uh, may have had like an efficiency for her. Um, when she didn't have her own place, would she essentially couch surf with family? Yeah, she had um, lots of good uh, friends. Um, one in particular, um, she would stay with um yeah were there periods of time that you were aware she was staying outside uh yeah i um remember talking to my mother and um i want to say some sort of church found her and uh I remember talking to her and it being a lighthearted conversation with her, but the her, her explaining, you know, that this woman came to find her outside and whether it was giving her warm clothes or a place to stay, um, you know, that was her lifestyle. Yeah, she would struggle. And when you talk about her struggles, and we don't have to get into too many details, but did she struggle with addiction? Oh, yes. Um, I later learned about uh, a tragic event um, of our times in the village as a kid. And, you know, as a kid, I really didn't understand why. Um, or how my mother was, but as an adult, I just really felt for her. And um, she would even speak about, you know, going to treatment and it not being a good experience for her. Um, yeah. When you go say going to treatment, was that for alcohol? Mm -hmm. Okay. And mm -hmm is yes. Yes. Sorry. Okay. No, you're fine. We just have to make a clear record. 
At some point, did you make the decision to um, report your mom is missing? Um, so I was that 2019, I believe I filed a report. Um, I know before I filed the report, we looked for her. Um, there were lots of confusion and frustration of maybe seeing her from uh, family friends. Uh, there was also an instance, and I, please forgive me, I don't remember if that was 2017 or 18, where my family was contacted by the police department in Anchorage that they had found my mother and she had passed away. Um, so there was a instance where I go down to the medical examiner and sign papers thinking this was my mother, but it was an instance of wrong identification. Um, there had been a lady who overdosed, I believe. I even got her medical uh, packet and I didn't open it because at that point I knew um, this was not my mother. Uh, she just simply had her ID on her. So your mom's ID, like her physical, like that's why state they identification. That's on. why they contacted my family. Okay. Um, so there was a point that you were told that your mom was deceased when she wasn't. Right. And I remember after that, like, thank God. Okay, now where is she? <laughs> Did family have contact with her after that? You know, there was a photo taken in 2017. Um, I know for sure. Um, in June, or sorry, January the 23rd, I reached out to my aunt and, hey, have you seen mom? You know, please give her my number. Um, March of that year, um, she had, we had spoke and, you know, I could um, sense her nervousness and scaredness of, hey, I haven't seen her. Um, I'm going to show you a photograph that's been marked States Exhibit 25. Council and the court has courtesy of this. Um, do you recognize that photograph? Yes. Um, I'm cropped out, but uh, that's a photo I had taken with my mother. And when was that photo taken around about? Um, You know, uh, I'm I'm not sure. I want to say 2016, but I, I really couldn't tell you. I don't. Is that the last photo that you had with her? Yes, and it would. Um, I would normally have you know a timestamp, but I had to screenshot that, and um, I just I don't know when that was taken exactly. Okay, but it was. Um around 2016, you believe? I want to say, yeah. Okay. I'd move at this point for the admission of States Exhibit 25. No objection, Judge. It's admitted. You may publish. Please. And when you reported your mom missing, was that February 9th, 2019? That sounds correct. Okay. And it sounds like um, at this point, you're having a hard time remembering when the last time somebody had seen her was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would it refresh your recollection to look at the missing persons report that you made with the police that day on February 19th, 2019? Sure. Okay. Yeah. 
show you the bottom of this um, and ask you a couple of questions. May I question from here, Judge? Yes. Okay. Do you remember going to? I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, maybe your approach, Judge. Yes. Looking at this document, refresh your recollection about the what you told the police the last time your mother was seen was? Honestly, no. Um, I just remember being, um, just knowing something was wrong, uh, scared, nervous. Um, yeah, it, it really doesn't bring up any memory, but that, obviously that's what I said. Okay. At the time that you talked to the police, would you have, would it have been important to you to provide them the most accurate information you could about yes. your mom? Okay. And did you tell them that Margaret Lestenkoff, her sister, had seen her in July of 2018? Yes. And did you do some work on your own before you went to the police to try and find your mom? Oh, yeah. Um, Tell the jury about that, please. Uh, um, I remember speaking with family. Um, I remember going to uh, places around Anchorage asking um, if anybody had seen her. And when you say places around Anchorage, did you go to hospitals, bars? Where did you go? Um, <laughs> I had went to the hospital um, thinking, you know, since this uh, issue was is very important, they'd tell me, but of course, HIPAA, they couldn't. Um, I also went to a liquor store I know she went to regularly um I remember them saying they had seen her but it was unclear you know no actual facts uh, I went downtown um and after you reported your mom missing in February of 2019 um, when is the next time that you heard about her? So in October 2019, I was contacted by family um, to meet with a detective. And um, looking back at that, I was in complete denial or holding on to any hope. I remember thinking, wow. <laughs> They found her, you know, maybe she's somewhere. Um, and storylining that last night, I just am in awe that I believe that, you know. And when you met with the detectives in October, did they tell you essentially that this case had arisen and that she yes. had been located? Yes. I think that's all the questions I have for you, Ms. Grimaldi. I imagine the defense has some. Okay. Good morning. And I just have a, a few questions for you to try to get one specific timeline. Um, during your direct examination, the state asked you about two different events. One was um, when you filled out the missing persons report in February 2019, you told them that your mother had last been seen of July 2018. You recall that part of your testimony? Um, I have answered everything, including that report, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. And then you also mentioned a time where you were contacted to help APD um, identify 
your mother and it turned out not to be your mother. And you said that was in 2017 or 2018. So my question is, what order those happened and you fill out the missing persons report before or after you were called in by APD? You know, that was some time ago. Um, and I just can't recall for the life of me. I tried looking through both phones to get a more solid answer. Um, but I'm just unsure. Okay. Thank you. I just want to clarify that last that last part. Was there a time prior to you reporting your mom missing that the medical examiner's office called you? No. Um, the woman that I'm had sorry. the wrong ID? So that was before I was contacted uh, by Detective Cross. Okay. So um, she was then Sergeant Cross, Detective Lee's boss. She's African-American. Yes. About my height. Yep. Okay. She called you to tell you that they had found your mother's remains, correct? Uh, 2019, yes. Yes. My question was the contact with the medical examiner's office where they had your mom's ID on somebody else's prior. body. Thank you. Sorry. That, that incident was prior to getting contacted by Detective Carl. Yes. And you're done. Let me step down. Thank you. I think it's probably appropriate for a break. Dr. Rolf is in route. Okay. 15 minute break then, folks. <clears throat> Be seated. Before I release you, I just want to tell you one thing and give you the benefit of uh, some feedback we've gotten from juries over the years. Uh, some jurors really resent it when they see a lot of bench conferences. Um, some jurors think that that means a lot is being kept from them and they appreciate seeing, in those jurors at least, appreciate seeing the uh, objection the actual objection and then the judge's ruling and and whatever interchange they can get so take that into account when you decide whether you're going to seek a bench conference or not okay i can call the court just for the sake of timing today we're moving a lot quicker than i expected which i'm very pleased about we have detective or not detective but dr rolf is on her way detective cordy is um going to be here after her those were the witnesses that we had lined up for today. I'm going to try and get, see if I can get somebody else here, but I'm looking through my files about who might be close. Good. Thank and, you. And we'll plan accordingly for tomorrow, but it might be a short day. We'll, we'll do our best to get. As long them. as we're moving according to schedule, it's, uh, yeah. it's working well. Yeah, we're ahead of schedule at this yeah. point. Thank you. Okay, let's take our break. Regards. A in 19901 CR. Mr. Smith is here. Council are here. Jury is waiting in the jury room. Before we bring them in, um, I'm going to tell council that I'm going to uh, remind jurors again of the instruction to not have, not talk about the case with anyone and not, not remain in places where the case is being discussed. And uh, I, I want to remind the other folks that are here as well, that uh, jurors are forbidden from uh, communicating with with anyone connected with the case, really. And uh, here in court, in the in the courtroom. So uh, let's just all keep that in mind. And is there anything else we need to take up? Um, yes, there's along those lines. Uh, I think it's why the court is going to be giving that admonishment is we did have Peter's five jurors who are out in the lobby outside the courtroom with uh, the family after the most recent round of testimony. I don't know what, if anything, they heard or how it might affect them. We do know which jurors it was. I was going to ask if the court can 
bring them in here one by one and just ask them, you know, a couple simple questions, which is, did you hear anything and will it affect your ability to be impartial? No, what I'm going to do is remind them of their obligation to report to the court if there is anything overheard uh, or if anybody tries to have a conversation with them. They've, they've already been instructed that they're not, repeatedly instructed that they're not to um, pay attention to any conversations or have conversations with anybody about the case or uh, they, they've been given a number of on, admonitions on point. And uh, all over the state, jurors ride the same elevators or climb the same stairs with other participants in the case and uh, stay in the same hotels, eat at the same restaurants, fly on the same planes in and out of, of the uh, venue. And um, I think that that's why the instruction that I gave at the beginning was written is because it's in inevitable that people in, in Alaska, especially will run into other people. So I'll just remind them of it. And if, if uh, I'll trust them to follow the instruction. And I don't have any information that there was any contact that other than proximity being on the same hole. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't want to keep singling jurors out unless there's a really good reason to do so. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's bring them in. Please rise for Please be seated, everyone. Got our jury back with us. It's all 1028 or so. And everyone else is here that needs to be here uh, to proceed with the State versus Brian Stephen Smith trial. Uh, folks, I instructed you at the beginning about not uh, not making up your minds until you've heard everything you need to hear, not looking things up and not talking about the case with others. Uh, and and uh, I, I also told you I was gonna remind you of that every day. So today, now's the time. <laughs> uh, please remember that you have a duty to uh, both avoid overhearing any uh, conversations or any uh, information at all about the case that might be outside the courtroom. And uh, you have a duty to report if there, if anything is accidentally overheard. And uh, uh, remember that instruction throughout the duration of the trial. It's inevitable in a, in a state like Alaska and in a case like this, that somebody will see somebody or pass by somebody um, but just remember, you have the obligation to avoid any any outside input at all. Okay. Thank you. State may call your next witness.
There's a safe call to Detective Dave Porter to the stand. Okay, Detective, right next to me, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Remain standing, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony will get the case now before this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and not the truth? I do. Thank you. Please proceed. Please state your name. Start your question. David Cordy, D A V I D C O R D I E. When you're ready. Detective Cordy, where do you work? I'm a detective with the Anchorage Police Department. How long have you been with the Anchorage Police Department? I started uh, in the fall of 2005, went to the academy in 06, graduated FTO fall of, uh, fall of 06, and then went to the investigative division in spring, about well, January of 09. And uh, what division of, what detective division are you with at the Anchorage Police Department? Currently right now, I'm at, I'm a cold case, homicide, uh, sexual assault detective, but for 14 plus years, I was actually assigned to the homicide unit. And were you assigned to the homicide unit then in 2018? Yes, I was. Can you explain to the jury a little bit about how cases come to be assigned to detectives in the homicide unit? Sure. Um, almost every case that comes to the police department is normally goes to the patrol division first. Patrol division uh, goes to the scene, determines what resources are needed to, uh, to include a sergeant or command staff, at which time the decisions are made if it's going to be uh, a criminal act took place. So if a criminal act uh, took place in the incident, then uh, <coughs> procedures start into effect or they get a hold of the investigative division. If it's during normal business hours, we're at the office anyway, so that's easy. But if we're at home, we're on uh, call 24 seven when we're in the homicide unit, uh, either a supervisor or commander will notify us at home if we're available to come in to assist in the investigation at which time we come in and then uh, we are briefed and then certain detectives are assigned with certain duties for the investigation. Are there other ways other than patrol that detectives might be assigned to a case, other through an initial patrol investigation that detectives may be assigned to a case? Absolutely. Like I said, most of the times, I would say 98, 99% of the time, but occasionally the information will come directly to the police department, which will be uh, vetted to the investigative division if it's, if it's needed. Were you involved in a, uh, an investigation that ended up being a direct report to the police department that you were assigned to in 2018? Yes, I was on August uh, 17th of 2018. And just without getting into the, any of the details of the investigation or the nature of it, how did this uh, case come about to be assigned to you? It came in. It was a Friday. It came into the unit. We have limited staff because we work four 10-hour shifts. So some of us are there Tuesday through Friday. Some are there Monday through Thursday. So we have limited detectives on Mondays and Fridays. I was working that Friday. Um, everyone in the unit received emails uh, of information from a source that wished to remain anonymous of details involving a possible incident. And then were you assigned ultimately to work this this anonymous um, report? I don't know if I was assigned or voluntold, but either way, I got it that day. So. Okay. And without getting into the details of what um, the anonymous um, report involved, did you become um, familiar with um, Mr. Smith? Yes, I did. And what information about Mr. Smith um, in 2018 did you um, learn about him? I uh, learned one thing that he was from South Africa, that he had a distinct accent, a British accent. And then we uh, learned information from the source of a black. Ford Ranger pickup truck with a topper on it that he was that was that he was utilizing at that time. And during this investigation, did you also make contact with an individual named Alicia Youngblood? Yes, she ended up being the person that provided the information to start with, and then um, volunteered her identity and actually met with me several times. I want to fast forward then to 2019, um, October 1st, 2019. And did you become uh, involved in the investigation that brings us here today? Yes, I did. Kind of in a unique way. But um, actually, I don't recall if I arrived at work late that morning or if I was out on another investigation prior to that. But I came into the building and at which time we have a conference room, a detective conference room, where we normally have our briefings that uh, take place on the case facts that we're going to work on. And Detective Lee was conducting a um, a briefing to the other unit members. So I sat in on that briefing. 
And based on that briefing, um, what information did you provide Detective Lee? Um, as soon as he started giving the case facts in general, um, I said right away, this sounds familiar to me. It sounds like it could be uh, it's related or consistent with the 2018 incident with Miss Youngblood. And then they, um, Detective Lee actually played a video. And as soon as I heard the voice, I said right away, I said, once again, I said, I thought that was related to the 2018 incident. And did you provide them further information to Detective Lee as, as to a potential um, suspect? Yeah, so I had to go back to my desk because I couldn't remember the names right off the top of my head, but I did some uh, research quick and I was able to provide uh, the name of Mr. Brian Smith and Ms. Youngblood uh, to Detective Lee within minutes, if you know, shortly after that. And is this uh, the briefing? Was this in regards to the images and videos that were provided to APD by Ms. Kassler? Yeah, so SD card or with still photos and videos, yes. Let's talk some a little bit further about um, what other um, assistance you provided in this investigation. Uh, it, Detective Lee was the assigned case officer, correct? Yeah, he was uh, tasked as being the lead investigator on the investigation, yes. So then how do the other detectives um, get assigned duties if they're assisting the lead investigator? Uh, that's kind of decided at the briefing. Once it's determined, you know, it's a criminal act, and we're definitely going to go full, you know, with the full unit working the investigation. Um, some of us are better at some things than other things. Um, so we kind of volunteer and the lead detective and the sergeant uh, come to a compromise on what who they want to do, what task related to the investigation at hand. And uh, so we just start uh, uh, lead detective starts doling out projects for people. And that's how we start the investigation. What are some of the things you did to assist Detective Lee in this investigation? Uh, I know I helped him with um, some of the phone tolls. I started a affidavit, which is a written document to acquire search warrants um, to assist us in the investigation. I started that and then I handed it off to him. I didn't apply for any search warrants. But what that is, is just a kind of a storyline of what is presented to the courts that allows us to get certain evidence by search warrant. So I started that for Detective Lee and then handed it off and then he continued to be the affiant from then forward. What were um, some of the records that you anticipated writing the search warrant for? Or uh, we, some of the items, excuse me. There was multiple items. I know one in general was the phone records um, that we wanted to get a, you know phone records for Ms., uh, Mr. Smith and start associating with those so we could start tracking cell phone towers and people's locations and things like that. And how did you have Mr. Smith's cell phone number? I had it from the previous investigation. Um, and then we did some research and it appeared he had the same number in 19 that he had in 18 when I um, looked into it. At some point then, did APD receive those records um, after serving a search warrant? Yes, I believe we received them fairly quickly. Um, I ended up getting a hold of uh, FBI agent uh, Eric Perry with the CAS team. And he has connections uh, within the phone industry to get stuff that, uh, on, on a quickly so that we don't have to wait and uh, jeopardize our investigation. So he was able to get those records fairly quickly, if not almost you know, within that day. So can you describe how that relationship with Mr. Perry works? <clears throat> um, the FBI CAS team is a specialized cell phone analysis unit. They have different sections of the country. I think they four to six states. There's multiple teams of FBI agents, and they are professional technicians slash agents when it comes to anything to do with cell phones. Uh, they attend training all the time. Um, they assist local law enforcement with assisting us with cell phone plotting, towers, locations of cell phone devices, and the actual tolls itself, too. They'll assist us with that running report. on who the person was contacting, what number that person was contacting. And um, it's just a great assistance when you're trying to track people and you're trying to locate people's locations based on cell phone tower analysis. So during the early stages of this investigation, is it fair to say you were sort of uh, the liaison between APD and Mr. Perry? Yeah, I've had multiple experiences uh, working with Agent Perry over the years. And uh, we just had a good working relationship and everybody knew it. So they knew that he'd answer my calls immediately. 
and uh, get on the case. So I was kind of tasked with that, which I gladly did. Did he, um, when you provided him the records, did he uh, give you an information as to Mr. Uh, Smith's location at that point in time? Yes, he did. Well, it's kind of bits and pieces. We would give him a timeline, you know, because the full report, we get anywhere from 30 to 60 to 90 days of, of data from the cell phone companies. So it depends upon, we're looking at certain targeted times. I would present that to uh, Agent Perry, and then he would get us the analysis of just a small timeline and eventually give us the whole analysis. But at the beginning, just certain bits and pieces. In addition to timelines of based on cell phone records, is there another way that you can use cell phone records to determine what cell happened? Came in on, came to my knowledge on 8-17, which would have been a Friday, uh, August 17th of 2018. I believe the information started to come in a day or two prior to that, sometimes it takes a little bit to get to us, filter to us, but it was several times a day there was information being provided. And then um, Mr. Ayer asked you about, um, you know, your, your numerous contacts with Ms. Youngblood. How would you describe Ms. Youngblood's demeanor when she was um, communicating with you or APD? She was very willing to assist any way that she could. Um, she was very concerned of what she was reporting. Um, she felt it was valid, her, the information that she was providing us. And she continued to cooperate and assist in any way she could. Every contact that I had with her, and I, I think that's the same with when I was gone for a short period of time, she met with other people too. Okay, thank you, Detective. That was the only question. Good job, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, up here next to me, please, Dr. Rolf. Good morning. Good morning. Please remain standing, raise your hand, and right hand, swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony we give in the case now before this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and not the whole truth? I do. Thank you. Please proceed. Please state your name. Please your name. My name is Kristen Marie Rolf. My first name is spelled C R I S T I N. And my last name is spelled R O L F. When you're ready, come. Um, Dr. Rolf, can you introduce yourself to the jury? Tell them what you do for a living. Um, 
I'm a medical examiner for the state of Alaska. And what that is, is a doctor that performs autopsies on people who die of sudden, unusual, or even violent deaths. Um, our job is to come up with the cause and manner of death in these people. And how long have you been doing that work? I've been uh, doing the work here in Alaska since um, 2014. I started in Ju July of uh, July 1st, 2014. 14. I also work for Kentucky doing the same job, basically, working for the University of Kentucky in the state uh, for um, 17 years, starting in 1997, and I worked as a medical examiner there as well. And can you tell the jury your training and experience a little bit about your schooling and what it takes to become a medical examiner? To uh, become a medical examiner, I um, uh, went to college and received my undergraduate degree in biology and pre-medicine. And that was at Kent State University in Ohio. And then I did my doctor of medicine uh, schooling or medical school in Toledo, Ohio, at the Medical College of Ohio at Toledo. It's now called the University of Toledo. And um, I received my doctorate degree for a doctor for a um, medicine, doctor of medicine in 1991. I then did uh, five years of uh, pathology residency training at Case Western Reserve University Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio. And um, what that is, is, what a pathologist is, is a doctor that um, basically does the lab work. They'll do um, yeah, you know, biopsies, they'll do autopsies like I do now. Uh, they'll uh, look at lab work like body fluids, other samples people submit for um, the diagnosis of a disease. And uh, that was a five-year program. And I got it board certified in anatomic and uh, clinical pathology. I then um, uh, did a year of training at the um, Cuyahoga County Coroner's Office in Cleveland, Ohio. And that was a year training for forensic pathology. Also got board certified for that as well. And that's just a test shows you, shows a person that they know um, their, what what the, they need to do in, in their career. It means they're knowledgeable in their field. Mm -hmm. And I started in Kentucky, worked there, moved to Alaska because I like Alaska. We were here as tourists and we decided to come pick up a job here. And in your 10 years with Alaska, or nearly 10 years, how many forensic autopsies do you think you've done? I perform about 250 to 300 autopsies a year. So, oh my gosh, maybe, maybe 4,000 or 5,000 by now. Okay. And then obviously additional ones in Kentucky as well. Yeah, the same amount. I mean, throughout all my career. And do you testify frequently? Yes. Um, I mean, it varies. You know, during COVID, there wasn't so many, but um, I testify in court. And here in Alaska, I testify numerous times in grand juries as well as in court. So I've testified in Ohio and uh, Kentucky and here in Alaska. Are you frequently qualified as an expert in the field of forensic pathology? Y yes, here in court. And that's for jury trials just like this? Yes. Okay. I'd move at this point, Judge, to qualify Dr. Rolf as a, an expert in the field of forensic pathology. No objection. <clears throat> court, she, uh, court finds her to be qualified in that field. And so I want to talk to you about what happens when um, you're asked to perform an examination on human remains, perhaps not a full body as would normally be, but what happened in this case where you're given essentially a skull? What does an examination like that look like? In, in this case, instead of a whole body, which I would perform an autopsy and do external and internal exam, in this case, all I received was the skull. It was basically the top half of a skull. There was no mandible, the jaw no jaw, but it had teeth and it had, uh, it was pretty much intact. And um, we
just testifying from a document or just testifying from memory. Right. Testifying from memory, please uh, don't just read. Let us know. Oh, yes. I was going to say I cannot remember or memorize everything I do. Uh, I three hundred cases a year, right? So let me Go let ahead, me so. direct you a little bit. Is it common for you to work with a forensic anthropologist? Uh, with the bone case, we would. Um, and if it's a suspicious case that I see something unusual about the bones, or if it's someone that's unknown, we may send for DNA and we might get X-ray and teeth. Was that the case in this case that when the skull came in, the the identity of the person was originally unknown? Yeah, it was unknown. It was just a skull that was found outdoors. And um, do you, you said you take photos of it before it's cleaned, it's cleaned, you take photos after. Do you at that point look for a um, cause of death? Yes, if we can. I mean, if it's a pristine skull with nothing on it. Uh, this skull did have something on it that, um, or in it that would um, indicate that there was a cause of death, at least in the head. Uh, of course, the rest of the body, I can't tell because the rest of the body was there. Okay. And so before you send it out to the forensic anthropologist for identification purposes, um, were you able to determine um, any defects in the skull that might have contributed to a cause of death? The skull did have a defect on the uh, left side. And something moving through the head which is in this case, a um, it was a gunshot wound um, in that skull. It's an internally beveled defect and means it chips out on the inside and the bullet was entering the head on the left side. And were there other findings inside of the skull that were consistent with a gunshot wound? Um, there was, well, there were tiny metallic fragments, which on the um, anthropology report, which I don't want to talk about in, in detail. So it was seen in much better um, detail than our own x-rays, but there was opaque material on an x-ray that was consistent with shavings from a bullet or material from a metal. Okay. And it would it be common in your practice to consult with that anthropologist and use their x-rays to help make your diagnoses? Yes, their, their x-rays were actually more a little more detailed than ours. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification as state of exhibits and the court has a copy of these. I'm okay. actually going to give you those copies. Um, our twin Apologist. Yes, uh, 10 through 18 are ours, 19 through um, 23, 
three are, are, are the anthropologists. Okay, and is 24 some dental x-rays that you ultimately sent out to a uh, forensic odontologist? Yes. Okay, and was 24 taken by your office? Yes. Okay, I'd move at this point for the admission of 19 through 24. And then uh, where is the defect that you categorized as a bullet defect? That's where we're at. Let's see how rounded it is on the back. And then let's go ahead and go to exhibit 12. What is exhibit 12? Exhibit 12 is again the skull, and there's still some debris. There may be a little bit of flesh or material left on the skull. Also, it doesn't look ancient. It's not brown or, you know, something that looks almost like a fossilized skull that people find of uh, maybe native burials or something like that thousands of years ago. This looks more like a recent skull. And also there were fillings in the Did you have an opinion about whether there had been animal predation? Um, there were some areas that were, you know, chewed or missing. Maybe small animals got through it or something, but not much. Okay. And, and did you, um, is any of that impact your opinion about the gunshot wound to the left side? Um, like the, the actual gunshot wound? No, no, not that one. Um, if anything is missing, I can't tell you whether it's going to in it or not. Okay. I guess to put a finer point on it, the idea that there might have been animal predation doesn't impact your decision about whether or not that that was a gunshot wound. No, that was typical of a gunshot wound. And then it's supported by the material that's in the x-ray. Understood. So exhibit 13, what is this? 13 is the bottom of the skull. This is the very bottom of one's head. And in here, this big hole here, that's where the spinal cord and the brain stem goes through. It's called the brain and the And then this is the rest of the back of the skull, the back of the person's head. There's teeth. And these teeth have fillings in them. So that shows that this person was alive, at least in the last whenever people could make fillings that was probably within a hundred years or so. <laughs> um, and is that something that you look for to help determine identity? Yeah, so look at the teeth, see if there's wear, see if they're 
nice and straight or they're crooked or um and then the important thing is were, were they restored by other people and the metal and the teeth are restorations or cavities were filled now is there just a giant database of people's dental records floating around for um for people to use well there's namus um that's well, the actual what the abbreviation means, but that is a system that there are um, people that are missing mm -hmm. and they're on one end and then people that are found are on the other end of NamUs and we try to compare them. They do that, it's a national database that and I don't work with personally, but that's one of the databases we look up. Also, if there's anyone local that's missing, the police may have records or at least know of this person if it's a local missing person okay now so if somebody is not in namus as a missing person you would actually have to have their identity to send to a forensic odontologist correct yeah we'd have to know who the scholar could be or might be to be sent okay exhibit 14. exhibit number 14 is the right side of the skull and this, um, and there's some parts are missing, so I can't tell you if that's a gunshot wound or not. And um, but uh, the rest of the head on the side of the room, but no gunshot okay. wounds that I could see. Except at 52. This is the top of the um, skull, and this just shows the sutures going across the coronal, like one side to side, and then there's a Sagittal suture going down the middle. And when you're a baby, you're born. When you're born, you know, a baby, as you grow, the skull plates join and then they form these little creases. So these are not cracks or fractures from someone that injured this person. It's a, uh, it's, those are natural sutures that the skull fuses together. And exhibit 16. Exhibit 16 is the skull, uh, well, somewhat cleaned up. The leaf is still stuck there. You can see the, the hole better, and it's rounded on the back. And that's what made me suspicious that I think this is this person was shot or has a good shot. Is 17 a better close up photo of that? 17 is a good close up photo. You see the rounded part. And then this broke out, maybe just the angle of the bullet going in, or maybe an animal may have chewed on it or not. I couldn't tell. I don't see too many marks around it. Um, and then there's a little bit of dirt still up on the skull. Okay. What is exhibit 18? So there were 18 is an x ray of the orograph of the skull. And the, this shows, um, yes, yeah, much Please. clearer picture showing these tiny fragments in the skull, those are metal, and um, those are consistent with being shot with a bullet. And, and then, um, let's see, maybe a few small fractures. Okay, so area. what I wanna talk about is a bullet. Like sometimes you will have an entry and an exit wound, correct? Yes. In this case, all you have is an entry wound. That's all I can see. Okay. Maybe down here could have been an exit, but you couldn't diagnose it. It's hard to tell. I mean, it could have gone up a frame magnum. Um, I did not open the skull, so um, I wasn't 100% sure of an exit. Uh, the bullet could have still remained in the head, and then I either fell out. If the skull is moved around, and then the brain isn't there, the skull would or the bullet would go. It would leak, leak out easier. <laughs> um, but uh, and, and then again, since we have nothing down here, the bullet could have gone out the frame of magnum, maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, but you do have metallic fragments. Is there any other like reason that somebody would have metal in their head that you can think of? I mean, it would be like surgery or first night an old uh like a brain tumor removed an old surgical um 
incision or uh, a plate or anything put on the skull. It'll be a patterned round appearing plate or a different shaped plate. And it would be obvious uh, that it would not be something irregular and small. But okay, so you diagnose this as a gunshot wound. 19, what does that show? So 19 is a picture of the skull. And I think this is an anthropologist picture, um, but it just shows the arrows around it. You talked about a uh, um, bevel defect. Is that is that apparent there? Um, you can you can kind of tell from the outside. It's uh, there's no beveling on the outside, but when you put your finger around, you can feel that there's a beveling on the inside. But you can't see the beveling in this picture. It is a thin area of bone as well. But um, okay. Let me look at the next picture and see if that helps. Exhibit 20, what does that show? The next picture is a photograph of the gunshot wound, and there is bubbling. So when a bullet goes through an object, whether it's bone or like a piece of glass or another object, it will chip out the material as it's going through. It'll push out the uh, material on the opposite side where the bullet's entering through. And exhibit 21, what is that? Exhibit 21 is another radiograph of the skull showing these small fragments. Okay. And exhibit 22. So 22. And these are the uh, recovered objects. This is not what I did. This is actually the anthropologist report. And there's little fragments that were. And that's something that you relied on to make your decision, though, right? Yes. Okay. And those are the fragments that were removed from the head? Yes. Okay. And is that consistent with when you've done other autopsies? Um, let me put it this way. You've talked about hundreds, if not thousands, that you've done. Have you seen people shot? Yes. Numerous times. Are those consistent with bullet fragments that you've seen in other cases? Yes. Okay. 23. What does 23 show? 23 is from the anthropologist report, and it just shows what they, this possible product projectile path. It, they're kind of dark, so it's hard for me to interpret. I'd rather just say that uh, personally, from my examination, I have a bullet that went in the left temporal, point the right side of my head here, left temporal went into where the brain would be. So this bullet would cause a lot of damage to the brain. Even though the brain is gone, you know that a bullet went through this area, it's um, gonna cause a lot of injury to this person's brain. Is that gonna be um, where that bullet would have entered? Is that gonna be a survivable injury? Most likely not. Um, I wanna talk about 24. You said your office did dental, ex dental x-rays as well? Yes. Are these the dental x-rays that you took? Yes, these are x-rays of the teeth. And some of them have fillings, big fillings, small fillings, different size. Some teeth recently gone, or they were, might have fallen out of the skull. Doesn't look like they're healed or anything like that. So they might have been there when she when this person died. Um, the fillings are all unique. They're almost like a fingerprint in a person. Because everyone's teeth are shaped differently and everyone's fillings are placed in cavities which form in uh, different areas of the teeth. So it is a point of identification because obviously we don't have the flesh on the face. So we take these teeth pictures and we combine and we compare them, with, or our dentist would compare them with. Um, the old x-rays of the person when they were alive. And um, were x-rays collected or old dental records collected from um, Veronica Apichuk? Yes, and I would like to- you know, If it'll refresh your recollection, look at your report, please. Um, the, um, we identified this person as um, Veronica Apichuk through comparison of our dental x-rays, so, uh, postmortem with antemortem 
which means before the x-rays. Okay. And uh, Dr. Gagliano uh, did that. Okay, um, so x-rays were obtained from the um, South Central Foundation, is that correct? Uh, I, I don't have that name and all that there, if you have it. If it'll refresh your recollection, may I show you the letter from Dr. Gagliano? We just have a letter stating that we have antemortem before death um, x-rays um, from uh, the South Central Foundation. Okay, and those were for Veronica Abichuk? Yes. And they were provided to Dr. Gagliano? Yes. And then she provided you back a report? Yes, we provide both sets, like the antemortem, the postmortem x-rays, and then she provides us the letter. Okay. And she's going to testify later in the case, but based on that letter, were you able to make the identification that this, um, that this skull belonged to Veronica Abichuk? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you back up just a little bit before you're able to make this um, final identification here. And we can have the lights go up, please, Master Clerk. Um, before you were able to make this um, ID, when this was just an unknown skull that was found, you said you sent it to a forensic anthropologist? And that we sent it to, don't have the person's name. It was uh, University of North Texas. And were names provided to that person, to that anthropologist to, to rule out or rule in? From what I understand, I don't have the names with me, I only have my, my report. Would it refresh your recollection to look at the um, anthropology report? Yes. Um, I'm showing you that 16-page report. Um, at the time, the investigators provide the anthropologist the names of Mary Alexi and Linda Skeek. Yes, and these were people who were missing and we uh, provided these uh, names and possible <laughs> DNA to them to compare. Okay. And were they able to rule out those two individuals? Yes. Okay. And so then you sit with the skull and you know that it's not Mary Alexi and you know that it's not Linda Skeek. Was it not until October of 2019 that the name Veronica Abichuk was um, provided to the odontologist. I know it was later than that. I don't have the exact date on my um, in my head, but um, this was um, later. Uh, we came up with another name, and she had dental records, and we were able to compare. Okay. The, to the best of your recollection, the anthropologist never got the name Veronica Abichuk. No, not that I know. We they had these other names. Okay. I think that that's all the questions that I have. Um, actually, does the University of North Texas try and help with um, identifying the potential race or gender of the of the decedent? Um, it's an anthropology report. I don't have all this. I have to read this whole thing, but it might state that they, um, you know, whether it's a male skull or female skull, what kind of race <coughs> they would if it's an anthropology department. And um, and I can see that it does say, um, but I have to read it. Unless you have the people that made this report talk about it. Okay. I won't, I won't ask you to do that at this point. Thank you, Dr. Rolf. That's all the questions I have for you. Dr. Rolf, I want to start where you just left up, which is as part of your analysis, you did send this to uh, a forensic anthropologist, correct? Yes. For help and identification. Yes, right. identification, um, confirm all my findings and and you relied on that in your findings, right, to help you come to an identification? Yes. In the same way that you relied on the dental records that you testified about? Yes. And 
Um, <clears throat> Council for the state was about to ask you about the uh, the gender for that, and you were flipping through that report. Um, I point you to page two of 16 of that report that the questioning was uh, the anthropology report. Um, do you see page two of 16? Two of 16? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, yes. Biological profile sex. Uh, profile sex. And I'd have the to... report that you would have relied on in your analysis. Yes. Right. And it starts out by saying, although the general impression of the decedent sex is male. Yes. Right? I'm, I'm reading it. Yes, that's along what it does. with you. Yes, due to varying degrees of sexual dimorphism within populations, robust female can't be excluded. So it cannot be definitively excluded, correct? Yes. And then accordingly, the sex is best reported as undetermined. Yes. Right, but the report starts out by saying it is uh, the general impression is that it's a male skull. To have that first sentence, it says although the general impression. Um, so the review of this skull, this is all you had of this person, this person's remains, right? This is all I have is just the skull, no other parts of the body. Um, in that skull, you saw a hole with metal fragments in it that you diagnosed as a gunshot wound? Yes. Right. <clears throat> but you don't have the rest of the body, correct? No. So you don't know if there was trauma suffered to other parts of this person's body? Yep. And you don't know if this person's body suffered other trauma, whether that was before or after any gunshot wound? No. So had this person, for example, um, you know, been shot in the abdomen, bled out, and then were shot two hours later, they would have a gunshot wound to the head, but that wouldn't be what killed them, right? I, yeah, I, I'm, I guess if they died from some other reason and then they were just shot in the head later, I can't tell you. All I know is a, is a gunshot wound to the head, and all I can say that this gunshot wound would be fatal um, if it you know, but you can't just see, in the head alone. You can't see definitively, definitively that it was fatal. You don't have the rest of the body to examine, right? No, no, you're correct. Um, and then you also sent it out for dental record analysis to a drag is trained certified odontologist. Yeah, she's um, a dentist um, and odontologist for the state. Uh, I don't know about her. I don't know about the credentials as an odontologist. You'd have to ask Dr. Gagliano herself. No, and, and I think we will. Um, but if I can turn you to exhibit 13, do you have the exhibits in front of you? 13. That's the bottom of the skull? Yes. And in that you can see the teeth, right? Yes. How many teeth would you expect a you know, normal adult human to have? I, overall, we would have 32 teeth if we never had, you know, a person never had their wisdom teeth taken out or other teeth for, you know, braces. So, so assuming somebody would have their wisdom teeth out, because most people do at this point, right? How many teeth do you have left? Objection, speculation. Overruled. Well, assuming? 32 minus 4 is 28. Um, so person full set of adult teeth either you know 28 or 32 teeth depending on wisdom teeth it depends yeah yeah and how many teeth are in the skull that you examined here in exhibit 13 um there are multiple missing um so i see four on the top of the picture and i see four on the bottom of the picture and there's multiple teeth missing in the front it looks like there might be some absent um teeth so and then um in the back of the jaw, there's portions actually missing. So it's I can't tell the teeth were there or not. So, but we can see clearly approximately eight full teeth there, right? Yes. Out of the 28 to 32 you could have as an adult human. Yes. And that's what was sent to the forensic odontologist for comparison. Um, I don't have whatever which tooth they sent, but I would have to look well, you through the x-rays of the skull, right? You sent those. Yes. So that would well, we sent we sent this just the skull. And then they made their own x-rays. So presumably, if you sent the skull we see here in Exhibit 13, the odontologist would have had eight teeth to examine, right? Yes. So I have, Judge. You were asked some questions about the anthropology report. 
on page two and you were asked to read just the first line. Can I yes. have you turn to page five of 16 um, and read the summary opinion? Point one A regarding um, gender, well, sex, and ethnicity. Um, where it's a summary opinion for Alaska State Medical Examiner and has our case number. Yep. Medical legally significant remains, likely adult, thirty to fifty years of Asian, Asian derived, and that Amer Meridian, Hispanic, etc. Ancestry. Um, decedent's uh, sex and statute are undetermined. Okay, so likely an adult, 30 to 50 years, is that correct? Yes. Of Asian or Asian-derived, e.g. Amerit, Amerit Indian or yes. Hispanic, et cetera. Is that correct? Native. That means like a Native American in this general area. Okay, and the decedent's sex and stature are undetermined. Yes. So there's no finding that this was a male school. Is that correct? It, no, they did not confirm it was male. They were not uh, 100% sure it could be a male or robust female. Okay. And based on the dental x-rays, they were actually able to exclude Linda Skeek. Is that correct? Um, I know that uh, I think the... Go ahead and refer to subsection would like two to refer, there of that summary. Um, yes, they were unlikely to be Mary Alexi and Mary Linda Ski. Okay. And they it's unlikely to be Mary Alexi because of why? Um, they compared um, tooth number 12 with loss, which was lost antemortem, but no imaging available to confirm. The decedent's tooth number 12 was present. Okay, um, so I'm going to slow you down. So Mary Alexi, antemortem, did not have tooth number 12, correct? Yeah, and this person had one. The decedent has tooth number 12. We can rule that out this person. Tooth can't grow back. Yep, and then Linda Skeek, there were three teeth that they were able to make some determinations about, correct? Yeah. Yes, um, I can read this. Wait, um, and then let's... Uh, decedent it. has uh, tooth number 6, 11, and 13 present. Within the arch, uh, intermortem dental radiographs confirmed that Mesquite had teeth uh, number 11 and 13 extracted or taken out. So those 11 and 12, I'm sorry, 11 and 13 can't grow back because right. we only have two sets of teeth. So Linda Skeek was missing teeth 11 and 12, and the skull that you sent to the anthropologist had those teeth. Had those teeth. Okay. And then I think that you talked about some of the teeth that were missing didn't look like any healing had happened and some looked like they had. Yeah, these were the teeth in the front look like they were um, recently lost or fell out of the skull. And then um, the other, you know, there might be some areas where there's possibly healing, but I'd rather have you talk to the dentist about yep. that. There's and we will talk to the dentist, but you can look at the gums and see that some have been extracted and some. Or the bone. And yeah, the looking at the front of the skull, there were there's sockets there that were don't look healed over. Um, there might be one on the right side of the skull between the bicuspid and molar that might be healed, but I know that the dentist confirmed that. We will talk to Dr. Gagliano about that, but is forensic odontology a really common way to make identifications objection. in your field of work? Mm -hmm. What's the objection? Objection, Judge. Science is either there, it's not. Um, overall. Okay, is forensic odontology a really common way to make um, identifications in your line of work? Yes, yeah, especially for people who don't have facial structures that you can tell. That's um, all that I have for you. Thank you. You done, Dr. Thank you. I think I got those back in order.
Yeah, you get them stay the snacks with this stretch. Yes. Okay. Up here next to me, please, ma'am. You, you'll have to go through that pathway there. Good morning. Good morning. Please remain standing. Oh. Raise your right hand and we'll swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you'll give in the case of this court to be the whole court? Yes, sir. Thank you. Please be seated and please state your name and spell your last name. My name's Valerie Kassler, C A S L E R. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, counsel. Thank you, Judge. I'm just trying to the um, Good morning, Ms. Kassler. Good morning. Can I have you introduce yourself to the jury? Tell them your name, how old you are. My name is Valerie Kessler. I'm 52 years old. And where do you live? Um, right now, I live at the um, Barrett Hotel. Okay. And is that um, transitional housing? Um, it's They made them into apartments. So my um, um, South Central Foundation pays my voucher every month for a year till I can get housing. And how long have you been at the Barrett Hotel? Um, since... <laughs> December. Okay. December of this past year. Yeah. So a couple of months. Yeah. Okay. And I want to take you back to talk about a time in September of 2019. Did you come across something that was concerning to you? Yeah. Okay. Did that cause you to contact the police? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm going to take you to mid September. Um, did you get in a truck with a man? Yes. Okay. To tell the jury all about that. Where were you when it happened? I was on um, the 13th thing, Cars on Gamble. Okay. Um, behind, like, the parking lot is, like, a road that goes like this. And there's a white building and a big parking lot. And that's where he picked me up at. Okay. And when you say he, I saw you point. Do you see the gentleman in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And where is he located? <laughs> Pointing to the defendant's table. Okay. And you're nodding your head, yes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, when he picked you up, I want to talk to you a little bit about that time in your life. Were you an active drug user? Yeah. Okay. And what was your drug of choice? I smoked crack cocaine. Okay. And was that a time in your life that you were actively using? Um, yeah. And when he picked you up, why did you believe you were getting in his car? Well, at first he stopped and he was looking for, um, I got a lot of like nieces, but they're not blood relation. They're like nieces from the street that I've known for a long time. Okay. And he asked if I knew, I can't think of her name. It's been so long. And I was like, yeah. And and um, he asked if I wanted to get in, you know, ride around and see if he can spot her. And I was like, sure, I have nothing else to do, you know. And when you got in his truck, where'd you go? Um, we went all over, actually. We went, um, we went and parked down behind the um, Macaulay baseball field. Okay, is that by the Sullivan Arena? Yeah. And then... We went over there and we parked over there behind the Sullivan Arena and hung out for about an hour and a half there. And then we drove 
out to, um, I guess, down by Ship Creek and hung out there. <clears throat> were you all drinking? I was drinking, yeah. Do you remember what you were drinking? I was drinking vodka with uh, mixed with um, 211 Blackberry in a Gatorade bottle. Okay. And was he drinking? Um, I don't believe so. Okay. So you drive around. At some point, do you end up at a shell station? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, he said that he was leaving town and he'd be gone for like about two weeks. And he asked me if I had any money. And I was like, no. And he asked me where I lived. And I said, in the tent in the woods. And he asked me by myself. And I was like, yeah. And um, he said, well, let's stop in the shell station, see if I can get some money for you, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, he went in and I guess his car didn't work. And then he came back out the truck and he grabbed another one out of the console. That one didn't work. And um, he, uh, um, I dropped my when he was in the store, I dropped my phone. OK. And when I went to go reach down, I picked up two phones. Okay. But I got sick when I picked it up. And sick to your stomach? Yeah. Okay. Did you open it or look at it at that time? No, it was dead. Okay. So what did you do with the phone? Took it apart and stuck it in my pocket. Okay. Um, why did you take his phone? Because there was something on there that wasn't shouldn't have been on there. Well, did you know that at the time? No, but I got sick. Okay, you had a feeling? Yeah. Okay. Um, but when when we were before, um, right before we pulled it into the shell, he asked me if I seen his other phone. When we were down at the Sullivan, it sounded like when um, he closed his door, like something fell out. And he said he probably fell out there, but he said that he needed that phone because it was important because his work was on the phone. Okay. That was after you had his phone in your pocket, he asked you where it was? Yeah. And you told him it probably fell out at Sullivan Arena? Yeah. Okay. And um, where did he drop you off that night? Um, at the at the Shell Station. Um, um, did you... Ever tell anybody he dropped you back off at Shiloh Baptist Church? Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, um, no. Where were you staying at the time? In Shiloh, in the woods at Shiloh Church. I was living in Kent. Okay. And do you remember talking to Detective Lee and a Detective Baker? Yeah. Okay. At any point, did you ever tell either of those gentlemen that he dropped you back off by the church? I'm pretty sure I did. Okay. Just because he asked me where I stayed, and I told him I lived in the woods in the tent. And um, he goes, where do you want to get dropped off at? I said, at Trilo Church. I waited till he pulled off before I proceeded to go the in route to where my tent was. Okay. So he drops you off. You wait till he leaves, and then you walk back to your tent? Yeah. Okay. And I want to ask you about the things that you remember about him. You've identified him here in court today, but what specifically stood out about the man to you as far as physical features or voice? Um, his, his accent. Okay. And what was it? Um, it? it sounded like European or something. Was it a strong accent? Um. Hard to say. And then what about him physically did you remember? Um, that he was white and um, color of his hair and his truck. Okay. And what did you remember about his truck? The, um, the color and the way that the, um, the um, canopy on the back was. Okay. And so he dropped you off. You then proceed to your tent alone? Yeah. Okay. When you get back to your tent, what do you do with those with the phone? 
I grabbed my uh, cords and my chargers and I walked down to the um, the mattress place. We'll plug in, go charge. And um, when I charged, I got went back to the tent and I had been like up drinking and getting high for like two weeks straight. Okay. So and then I turned it on and I was like sober in like less than five minutes. Why? Because the the video there was three days from time September third to the fifth, and there's forty six pictures and. Okay. When you're saying numbers, you know, you said you were, you said you were drinking and using a lot of drugs at the time. Um, do you remember exactly how many pictures there were, or exactly how many videos there were? It was just like one whole video and i think every once in a while it, he'd like to like pause it but i think there's like 46 pictures total okay and what did these things depict well it showed him in the hotel room and in okay. she okay. You may proceed. Okay. Um, the objection was withdrawn. Objection was withdrawn. Okay. Um, so can you describe the pictures you saw on the phone? Um, in the hotel room, it showed her laying on the ground on the on the rug, and she was like all beat up. I mean, her face was not even recognizable. And he was hitting her and Telling her that she isn't going to leave the hotel alive, that he's killing her. And um, he, at one time, um, she's laying there and her legs. Did you ever see his face on the photos or the videos? Um, if you don't remember, that's okay. I can't remember. Um, I think it was pretty much him basically. Um, recording her okay. and um did you watch him put anything else around her throat yeah he like reached it looked like he like reached between she's on he like puts her on the on the luggage thing okay and, and then he puts a sheet over her okay and an empty like lavender backpack with all the zippers open, and then it shows him going, going towards the door again and going back down the hall and to the back. Is that the last of the photos, or were there any other photos? No, that was the last. And how did you feel when you found that? You couldn't recognize her. Okay, so when you're looking at the pictures, you don't recognize who it is. No, no. I mean, it sounds like later upon learning who she was, it made you sick because you had known her. Yeah. Okay. Um, in that moment, um, I had a doctor appointment. Before your doctor, is there, do you know somebody named Tracy? Yeah, Tracy Thompson, my um, kid's auntie. And she was like, Hearsay. I think it's not for the truth of the matter. It's to explain what this witness did next. Ask a question. Okay. Um, when you showed it to Tracy, what was her reaction? She was like, exactly, that's real. You know, that I don't want to see it. You know? um, not exactly, but I said, um, Doc, I got um, something here. I'm pretty sure it's a real, it's a homicide. I said, you want to look at it? And he's like, I believe you, Valerie. He goes, how do you want to go about it? He goes, you want to call the non-emergency number? And I was like, yeah. And he said. How did you know that that was the Midtown Marriott? Because when he he, he when he got on Wi-Fi, he, it's on the phone. 
it's in, you know. You said you saw an image of the Wi-Fi? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like when you turned Yeah, it, it had uh, like, um, when you go on the Wi-Fi, it said um, the hotel name, the room number, and who the room was um, registered under, and it had his name. Uh, and that's why you named the card that? Yeah. Wade Baker, and then ultimately Detective Lee pushing you and telling you they didn't believe you about that? Well, they they was like, not not so much in those words. They're like, um, they got a hold of me like a background. Well, like no. Was that like? Did you pull up the internet in that page? No, here, no. Was it it was it was. He had it all with the with the recording. Oh, like it's like the, it's like he took a picture, uh, like a screenshot of the of the phone. Yeah. Of what the um of him. was and what the internet power. Well, like, okay, like, okay, like you got your phone yep. and you go on Wi-Fi and it showed it was like a white background and it looked like a door, like, and it had the room number, like the room plate on there. It had um um Wi-Fi connect to wi-fi at marriott and it said um the guest is brian it had his name and that seemed like a screenshot that he had yeah done. yeah like like he's like um like as a i don't know a souvenir i believe that that's all the questions i have for you valerie um at this point judge i think I think we're requesting to break for the day at this point. Okay. Defense wants oh, to break for the day. Yes. Move your approach, Judge. Okay. Yes. All right, folks. We're we're actually moving a lot faster than we thought we would. So, in a way, that's good news, and uh, we're going to break for the day. We'll come back tomorrow at eight thirty, please. Sure.